Hello and welcome to our first ISCN webinar of 2022. And as folks are filing in, I just want to let you know you are in the right place if you're here to learn about um, impacts of soil erosion on the carbon cycle and on carbon sequestration. Uh, we have about 270 people registered for the meeting, so it'll take a couple minutes for everybody to get into the virtual room. Um, but I'll let you know that we have two wonderful speakers with us today. We have Christophe Van Oost, who we're so fortunate is willing to call in from Belgium, where it's, I think it's nine o'clock at night. <laughs> um, and he's really a leading expert on this topic and will be able to give us a, a global perspective on soil erosion and carbon. And then our second speaker is Ken Waka. I hope not that right. Yeah, Ken Waka, um, who's a, a, a soil scientist and erosion expert um, associated with the National, oh gosh, National Soil Erosion Laboratory in Indiana. Um, so he'll give us more of a field to catchment scale perspective and uh, within the Corn Belt as well. So I want to give these speakers as much time as possible to give their presentations. So. Christoph, when you're ready, um, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, also thank you for the invitation. It's, it's a nice opportunity to share a bit of my research to, to you guys there in the US. Um, I would like to talk a bit about my research I did on erosion and the links with, uh, with the carbon cycle. Um, just trying to get my slides correct. Yes. Uh, so I think we all know that uh, erosion is one of the biggest threats for uh, soil health and it also implies of course that with erosion via soil conservation and management is of course critical to enhance uh, soil functions. And one of those soil functions is of course uh, soil carbon sequestration which is directly related to, uh, to our climate and this is actually the topic I would like to address today. Huh? So, at present, there, there's a bit of a, of a controversy um, in the, the scientific literature whether agricultural soil erosion actually represents a sink or a source for atmospheric uh, CO2, and which has, of course, big implications for um, understanding of, of climate change, both past, uh, present and future, of course. And so this, this is the topic that I would like to, to address. And um, as already introduced by, by Claire, I will do this a bit from, from a global perspective um, and talk a bit about the underlying processes. Um, before I start, I would like to, to briefly um, uh, go through the global significance of agricultural erosion. As so if you go to literature, um, there are many estimates available. Of course, there's, a, there's quite a big uncertainty on how important um, human-induced, uh, so agriculture erosion actually is, but like the, the main estimates kind of range between 12 and 40 petagrams uh, per, per year. And I know this number is, is, is not very meaningful to you, so I try to, to, um, to pinpoint that in a better way. So you can also think of it in order to produce your food on a basis uh, we have to erode about three megagrams, which is one, so one megagram is one metric ton. I don't know the American units, my apologies. So it's about uh, three tons per year uh, that you basically erode from our fields to produce your food. Um, in, in combination with that, so we, we erode our soils, but of course there's soil organic carbon which is associated with, with these soil particles. Um, if we connect that to, to uh, carbon content of the eroded soil, you basically end up with an estimate that annually, every year, about 0.5 to 1.5 petagrams of carbon are being uh, lost from, from our uh, fields where we produce our food. Again, this number might not be very meaningful to you, so I try to, to frame that a bit. So that's about 4 to 5 percent of the annual emissions uh, in relation to uh, the combustion of fossil fuels, and so that's that's quite significant. That that's a, that's a, that's a large percentage of, of that significant one. Um, as you can see on the map on on the right, um, 
it's not a uniform uh, pattern that you will see of, of soil erosion on a global scale. You will clearly see hotspots. And the only thing um, I would like to mention here, if you look on the, the graph on the left bottom side, is also the inequality which is associated with agricultural soil erosion. And so on this graph, uh, you see on the x-axis and uh, a metric for the richness of countries uh, uh, represented by the GDP, while on the y-axis you see the rate of erosion. And so you can see from the, the color, the lighter colors are the richer countries, and you see they tend to plot on the lower end of the um, average soil erosion rate for a country, while the poorest countries, they tend also to be subjected to the highest rates of, uh, of soil erosion. And of course, this is related to the fact that um, in the uh, developed world, we, we have better ways to, um, to implement soil conservation and soil management, but it's also related to the fact that most of the erosion actually occurs in the, the tropical regions. And um, that, that's why you have this, this, this inequality. Uh, what is also interesting to see is that there is actually a, a very large historical transient um, of sediment being generated by agricultural ero erosion. Uh, so from the start of agriculture, this has been always relatively small. This is, of course, related to the uh, population density, which was uh, relatively low at, at that time. As you can see, as indicated by the black line here, uh, this is the start of the Industrial Revolution. We have this big increase in, uh, in soil erosion, in, in the amount of sediment and also carbon being eroded from our fields, which is again related to the increase in population. Um, and what is interesting to see is that you already see some differences. So if you look at, for example, Europe and North America, we already see the effect of uh, the implementation of soil conservation programs uh, like in the 1950s, 60s, 70s and, and onwards. The same can be seen for, for Europe. But you can also see that for other regions, especially in those tropical regions, um, we are still uh, following the, the increase of population. So we also expect a, uh, a quite significant increase in, in soil er erosion rates in the, the near future as well. Um, okay, so I, I framed a bit uh, soil erosion from, from a global perspective and, and how important it is and a bit about rates and where we can expect all of soil erosion. Um, but now I'm going to focus a bit more on, on how this, this agricultural soil erosion can actually lead to a perturbation of the terrestrial carbon cycle. And already indicated in the introduction, there's, there's a bit of a controversy. Uh, in essence, there are two schools. And so the first school basically considers uh, soil erosion to be a significant source of atmospheric uh, CO2. And that is because they assume that uh, most of the, the carbon that is, is eroded and mobilized, as you can see on these pictures from, from our fields, that is directly emitted in, into the atmosphere. And from, from that perspective, they also consider soil conservation as a win-win, huh? because on one hand, uh, soil conservation can enhance uh, soil quality, soil health, and soil functions, while at the same time, if you can stop erosion, you can also stop or halt this large uh, source which was associated with the pre-conservation um, condition. And so that's, that's why they think this is a big win-win. You also see that most of the, the, the people that, that follow this line of thought are um, from the fields of agronomy and, and soil science. And this contrasts uh, somewhat with um, other fields, uh, and then it's more in the direction of sedimentology and, and geomorphology. And what they have actually quite a different view. They, they actually present uh, agricultural erosion not as a source, uh, but as actually a sink for atmospheric carbon. And they have this concept of the geomorphic uh, carbon pump, um, which is in essence not that complicated. In essence, they postulate that uh, a substantial amount of the eroded carbon can, can be recovered by atmospheric carbon. It can be transported via rivers, to lakes, to oceans, to burial sites. And in those burial sites, the carbon can actually be protected from, uh, from decomposition. And so the combination of these two actually provides, uh, provides a sink. Um, if you go into the literature, you will see that there is quite a bit of uh, 
controversy, uh, different papers, different approaches, different methods, different models. Um, so it's a bit all over the place. Um, in, in here, I, I would just quickly go through a bit of the, the processes and the, the mechanisms behind the things I, I'm talking about. And so I would like to briefly introduce to you the mechanisms that actually link erosion to carbon cycling. And there are four mechanisms, which I labeled M1 to M4. And these labels will actually come back in, in, the, in the next slides to, to structure those mechanisms uh, a bit. And so the four mechanisms um, that are behind this link between erosion and carbon cycling. So the first one is the, the carbon recovery, which I just mentioned. So it's the stabilization of organic carbon in newly exposed subsoil. The second mechanism is also related then to the geomorphic carbon pump, is the burial of carbon in a low mineralization context. The third mechanism is related to the school, which uh, uh, postulates that it's a big source. So they suggest that the erosion actually induces uh, a substantial increase in mineralization during and after transport. And also a mechanism which plays a role is, of course, yeah, with ongoing erosion of your ecosystem, the whole system can degrade to, to that extent that uh, plant production um, is starting to suffer which will also reduce your soil carbon inputs into the system. Um, just to visualize briefly these, 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 uh, these four con concepts in, in, a, in a sketch. Um, so what is actually happening? So you have actually a huge amount of uh, fresh organic matter, uh, label material, which is um, in your upper profile uh, layers. Uh, it's also one of the biggest fluxes in, in the global carbon cycle. So about 50 petagrams are respired back into the atmosphere from litter and, and plant material. And they're actually not stabilized to, to minerals. Um, and why is that? Well, because that layer is, is to some extent or actually already saturated with organic carbon. But if you actually look deeper into the soil profile, now, this is actually in, in, in the bedrock. This is where minerals and where clay particles are produced they're not saturated with organic carbon. So in essence, there is a spatial separation between the place where organic matter and carbon is available and the site where actually minerals um, are available, which have the potential to stabilize that carbon, that it's not just uh, emitted back into the atmosphere. So just to visualize this, if we now add the erosion into the mix, you will see that a particle uh, which is subject to erosion would actually follow this from this unsaturated zone where is it not loaded with organic uh, carbon. It will be mixed into a zone where this fresh material is indeed available. It will be transported over the land surface and, and be buried. Huh? So this is mechanism one, is uh, this recovery term. Mechanism two is then the burial where then this eroded particle can be protected from decomposition in a low mineralization context, huh? lack of oxygen, by water table. Um, and then the other mechanisms is indeed that during the transport, there's quite a bit of carbon being released again into the atmosphere. And the last mechanism, of course, is the degradation of your ecosystem. So what I quickly want to do in this last part of my uh, presentation during a few minutes, just instead of talking about this controversy, um, uh, we, we just try to, to put all the, the papers that have been published on, on this topic which provide quantitative information into one single framework. And the message I want to give you at, at the end in a few minutes of this presentation is, is the following. And so I have this controversy of source versus sink. Um, but actually, if you plot all these studies on, on a time scale or on a, on a spatial scale, you actually uh, start seeing some, some structure. And in most cases, um, people who are considering erosion to be uh, a source are usually working on, on relatively short time scales and also relatively uh, small spatial scales. While the opposite is true, uh, people um, or researchers or studies that suggest that it's a sink, they tend to cover uh, slightly longer uh, time scales, uh, several years to decades, as opposed to uh, minutes, days to, to, to seconds or, or years. And they also tend not to just look at what is happening in runoff on, or on the eroding uh, profiles. They tend to have a bit more of a catchment scale vision on things where they actually integrate um, 
uh, yeah, the whole system from eroding uplands to uh, the final stage, which is the burial in, into, the, into the ocean. Um, so I will quickly put these four mechanisms on a, on a geomorphic cascade. Huh? So we go from the eroding uplands via burial sites to the aquatic system and eventually the ocean. And I will quickly, for those uh, four mechanisms, um, try to put some, some numbers on it. So what well, is, in essence, the carbon recovery at, at sites of erosion? Um, but in essence, if you start from, from a steady state, uh, a system which is not eroding, suddenly you start agriculture and you start to erode, you will see that your carbon stock will, will go down. But surprisingly, actually, at some point, this will reach an, a new steady state where the erosional loss is in equilibrium with the input of carbon and the respiration. And so at that point, you actually have a system which is losing carbon, the carbon stock is going down, but in essence, it's representing a net sink for uh, atmospheric carbon. And if we look at the data which is at hand in the literature, we can actually see a very similar um, uh, structure uh, in the data that we have in our, in our concept. Eh? You can see if you go to systems which have been subjected to agriculture erosion for uh, several centuries to, to, uh, to millennia, you see that the, the fraction of the eroded carbon that is being replaced is close to one, suggesting that these systems are indeed in equilibrium with the erosional disturbance. In contrast, if you go to very uh, young systems, which are only recently being converted to, to agriculture, you see that that recovery term is much smaller and only a small fraction of the eroded carbon is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is recovered. And so there's also a transient response of an agricultural system to an erosional disturbance with respect to the um, exchange of uh, carbon between soil and, and the atmosphere. Okay, if we now go to, to the second mechanism, uh, so we are going down the geomorphic cascade, we went from the eroding uplands and the recovery down to the, to the burial sites. And actually, it's also surprising because we, we generally consider these as, as sinks uh, for atmospheric carbon, which is true. And so the carbon stocks in these burial sites increases because we keep on adding um, carbon, which we erode from, from the uplands. But actually, if we, if we look in detail at um, how this carbon is behaving after uh, years, uh, decades, centuries, and even millennia, we actually see from the data that actually there's quite a bit of carbon which is being released back in, into the atmosphere. And only a fraction of about 20% is really recalcitrant and can, can be stored at on, on longer time scales. Yeah? So here you basically have the opposite. So you have uh, a system uh, which, is, uh, which has an increasing carbon stock, but the input is lateral while it's actually uh, respiring carbon into the atmosphere. And so those burial sites, although they have an increase in their carbon stocks, if you isolate them, they basically represent a net source to the, to the atmosphere. Okay, and then the, the last mechanism, uh, which is unrelated to the, the school, which uh, um, suggests that the erosion is, is a large uh, source. And so these studies are usually done on very short time scales, and you can do this in, in lab conditions or, or via measurements in, in, uh, in, in runoff. And then you can actually see that yeah, this, this, this is actually available in the literature that the, the loss term uh, associated with um, runoff and in rivers is, is, um, is relatively small. And so in runoff, it's only 5 to 10 percent of the carbon. Um, which is being respired, while yeah, between 20 to 50 percent of the carbon that actually ends up in the river is also being lost uh, to, to the atmosphere. Um, just to, to wrap up my, my story, I see I have two minutes left. So if we put all these, these different boxes together, uh, so if we, we put the geomorphic cascade and all the different responses that I've shown from, from the different mechanisms on, on one graph, and so these lines, they're informed by all the studies that we put into our uh, data set based on the available data and literature. You can basically see two things. And so the first thing is that there is also, if we start agriculture here at one, and here we go further in time, this is everything representing uh, a sink, and the negative uh, is representing a source. The first thing you actually see is, again, you have these transient responses of basically every system, eh? whether it's recovery, uh, the burial site, or the net overall effect if we sum up all the different aspects. 
Um, the second thing we see is that we have both quite important sources and sinks uh, playing at the same time. And this is also why um, the net effect is actually not a very big source or a very big sink, but it's kind of yeah, compensated by um, both erosion representing a source in, in the, the burial sites and during it transport in the aquatic system and representing a sink on the uh, eroding croplands. So what are, what are the take-home messages that, um, uh, that I prepared for this presentation? So I think to, to some extent, I think this, this kind of framework where we look at different space and times can somewhat uh, reconcile the apparent uh, paradox. Uh, we have, as I just mentioned, we have both major sources and sinks. They partially balance. So I think this also means that um, the schools that represent a huge source or a huge uh, sink associated with erosion is highly unlikely. And it's probably a very small sink or a very small source. Uh, what I do want to mention here is that most of the data that we found in literature actually comes from high input systems on fertile soils. So there's much more data uh, that we need to have on, on how um, systems in low low input uh, how systems respond in a low input uh, in context. So as I already mentioned, so I think the opposing views of the controversy basically origi originates because yeah we we're, we're having processes that operate at different space and time scales, so that's not very easy to to uh, to synthesize. I also put emphasis on the transient response, uh, so a system which is subjected to erosion is most likely not in equilibrium. Um, which has implications for carbon sequestration uh, studies. And I would like to end my presentation, I see on time, um, with the, the message that, of course, soil conservation is, is, is imperative. We need to preserve our soils, we need to enhance our soil functions, but we cannot just uh, ignore both the sources and sinks which are associated with, uh, with, with carbon erosion. And so it's, it's not a big win-win, it's not a big sink neither, um, it's probably a small sink or a small source, and this needs needs to be considered when we talk about the effect of erosion on, on carbon sequestration. All right, I thank you for your attention, and I'm I'm happy to take any question you, you have. Right, thank you so much, Christoph, and. Um, all the folks that are attendees, I would invite you to post questions into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and I can pull some questions from there. Looks like we do have a couple. Um, um, there is one question for clarification question, um, could you describe recovery? Is this recovery of a plant community or recovery of a new equilibrium or some combination of that? No, when I use the term recovery, it, ba it basically um, refers to the recovery of the organic carbon content in a soil profile. Uh, so, uh, Soils which are being subjected to erosion, they lose a part of their soil organic carbon. Um, but via continuous plant inputs, um, a part or, or the total aspect of, of that lost carbon uh, via erosion will be replenished. And so in that sense, soils can recover from the erosional loss. And that's, that's the meaning of, of the word recovery for me. Okay, great. Um, and then question from me. So I think many of our attendees have a maybe a preoccupation um, focus on what's happening with emerging carbon markets and the quantification of carbon change, um, which I could say serves two purposes, right? One purpose is to incentivize um, certain practices that we want to see more of because of their multitude of benefits. But then the other purpose of it is to actually provide robust accounting to um, help stem emissions overall. Right? Um, and what is the role of accounting for erosion 
in this? And that's a really big question, I know. So I guess I would start with, you know, um, with the time horizon of carbon credits being five to 10 years, do you think that there should be accounting for carbon changes that are due to erosion? Um, but to be honest, no, I don't think so, because first of all, I don't think it's, it's representing a, a major effect, uh, whether it's a sink or a source, it will be a very small one, which is very difficult to, to detect and to prove um, and to monitor. So uh, from my perspective, I, I don't think it makes sense to, to include that in, in, in those schemes. What I do think, um, if, you, if you really want to, to measure and monitor soil carbon sequestration, and you need quantitative proof uh, to what extent your, your ecosystem can capture uh, carbon into soils. If you work in eroding systems, um, then the measurements uh, will also be largely influenced by the amount of, of erosion and, and the lateral loss of, of, uh, of carbon, soil carbon via erosion. And that's something which needs to be considered, otherwise your, your um, yeah, your monitoring scheme will be biased and it's not only representing the vertical fluxes and the, the direct exchange between soil system and the atmosphere but you also need to consider um, that there is also lateral movement and so that's an implication i think which is directly uh, relevant for uh, carbon credits and, and, and uh, yes yeah, soil carbon monitoring programs okay great and then um Oh, there's some good questions coming up here. Um, I'm going to jump in. So Jen Harnan asks, in your mechanisms one through mechanism four, you generalize that inputs to soil are likely reduced as a result of erosion. Um, she says, actually in fertilized lands and phosphorus and potassium rich subsoils, this seems overgeneralized. Are there also studies that account for increases increases in inputs during erosion? Um, so I'm trying to find... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. Are there systems where there is an increase in inputs due to erosion? I think that the, the general direction of thought is that erosion has a negative impact uh, on, on soil health. So I... I I find it hard to, to see that, that that could actually lead to a more fertile soil unless you're kind of eroding in a very a specific condition where we have like a BT horizon which is clay enriched. This this is possible, but I think these these are these are more exceptions than, than general rules. Um, yeah, and the only thing I maybe can can add to this, so I think yeah, the data that we have is indeed from high input systems where those negative negative effects of erosion are completely masked by the fertilizer input we, uh, we provide in, in our soils. And that's why it's also probably high, highly uh, like, like, more likely that in um, low input systems that, that recovery term will not be as, as big as we have in high input systems. So that yeah. the feedback is four will be probably much more important, but in a negative way, I think, not a positive. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so here's a question asking about the impacts of urbanization on erosion rates. Um, in your group's work, have you identified any differences in urbanized versus non-urbanized areas in terms of erosion rates and carbon impacts? Um, that's a difficult one. We, we I, I have not done any research in, in that aspect. Um, I know it's an issue, um, but I think yeah, surface-wise, the, the, the area being cultivated in, in, in croplands and subject to erosion is, is orders of magnitude higher than the surface we have in, in, in cities. Um, so I think that that's the reason why I think yeah, most of these, these studies, they, they focus on, on agricultural systems and not, not uh, urbanized systems. But I have to be honest, I, I, I cannot provide a, a decent answer on that question. Okay, great. But it's an interesting um, one. 
Yeah, and there's several questions that are kind of trying to get a handle of orders and magnitude of, of different situations. Um, so one question is, does wind erosion or water erosion contribute more to um, to carbon movement and sink and source dynamics? Yeah, on a global scale, uh, by far, water erosion is the most important process. Um, yeah, I don't have the numbers here, uh, but it's, I think, yeah, close to one order of magnitude more important. But it's it's in, in very specific conditions, like in the Midwest or in Australia or in, in Africa, of course, you do have regions where, where wind erosion is indeed more uh, important than, than water erosion. But on a global scale, uh, water erosion is by far the main agent to mobilize and transport uh, soil and organic carbon. But of course, you have regions where, where that's not the case. That was really helpful. Um, thank you so much, Christoph. I'm gonna go ahead and pass presenter mode to Ken now. And there'll be a little bit more time for questions too at the end. So Ken, when you have a chance, turn your webcam on and then I, um, there you go. And then uh, did you see the invitation to take control? Yep. Okay. Is that showing up? Yeah, it looks good. Sweet. All right. Um, so let's get to her. 20 minutes. All right. So I'm going to give a little talk about kind of my, my thinking or how I let this stuff roll around in my head about um, erosion, the process of erosion, and how it kind of shapes a lot of our landscapes or kind of our distribution of properties, you know, production and so forth across different landscapes. And kind of some thoughts I have as I've been, you know, doing some field research and rainfall experiments, both at field and, you know, looking at these different scales and kind of some takeaways on moving away from some of our traditional thinking of the homogenous properties to more dynamic um, connectivity of landscapes. So I'm going to focus in also on the on the Midwest. So US Midwest, we produce a lot of corn and soybeans. Um, you know, it's a global proportion, you know, significant amount. Um, you see on that that image there to the right, it's outlined in red. That's kind of our Midwest there. And the takeaway there is the darker the green means the more corn is being you know produced there. So this is a 2019 map there. Um, in the bottom left there, we see kind of the traditional or the history of our grain production there. You see a sharp ramp coming up around the 1950s. So things dramatically shifted there from our normal um, production to much higher. And which much with the much higher becomes a lot more um, variability. And a lot of that is driven by um, intensification and kind of its response that we're going to have from climate and weather. So climate, I think if you could think of it as across your, you know, like if you're looking at that map up there, there's it's going to tell you where you're going to grow your crops and what type of crops. Um, our weather, which you don't really have, you know, that much control over, is going to kind of tell you how much you're going to get out of that crop that year. So resiliency to shifting rainfall patterns and rainfall patterns and how that applies to water driven erosion. So top left there, you see some observed precipitation change. Um, darker the green means more is coming. Uh, and a separate issue, which I won't highlight today is some areas are getting less. So being able to predict and provide conservation or the right kind of management practices that can be resilient against these changes is, is a necessity. Now, it's not just the change of precipitation, it's the change in heavy precipitation. So what that means is you're going to get more rain, but it's going to come in a shorter amount of time. And when that comes, you got your, your energy from these raindrops, so the kinetic energy from falling drops, 
is going to just smash into the your soil surface and that's the the instigator of all the erosion processes right so based on your rainfall intensity drop size and you know when it happens within the year you may have windows where you don't have any cover that's protecting your soil or management becomes very important with residue and left on the fields or crop canopies or say a cover crop canopies something to shield that energy when it comes down and you know you stop it right from its first instigation of the erosion processes um so on the bottom right picture there kind of a this is a common site around much of our area around here after big rains you'll see like just little ponds and stuff hanging out in in a lot of these fields and a lot of that is just due to the impact from those initial drops and just hammering that surface and causing some ceiling effects and then to think about not just within a field but if you look at a whole system how how will some of these interactions of the of the changing precipitations the high intensity um, rainfall how is that going to propagate as you go up in in scale so i like this picture up here it kind of shows some of the problems dealing with what i'll call high spatial heterogeneity so basically if you're going to take soil samples within a field and you're going to have one sample is probably um, not going to give you an idea of how active your your landscape is so there's lots of little things drawn on there but what i want to show is that you know your topography kind of shapes how your water kind of runs off of your fields your management and your different types of eruptuses you could have tillage oriented eruptuses or just um, different controls that could stop and regulate water um, that's going to kind of shift and and kind of help to delay some of those processes and allow more water to go within the soil where it belongs so you'll have concentrated pathways forming you'll have lateral contributions you'll have splash erosion you'll have the mobilization of not only just your your primary particles you know your your fines and your you know your smaller um, particles but you'll have like aggregates moving just all depending on what the flow conditions are and you'll have stuff falling in and out of suspension in in a lot of those channels and um in the end you have a very heterogeneous landscape so stuff depositing up and down the field a lot of that can have impacts on um, moisture temperature which would impact your nutrient cycling so a lot of that the triggering processes from the erosion are just gonna cause further impacts on um, other cycles biogeochemical cycling and just overall production which kind of throws a wrench in the whole um, carbon cycle so soil organic carbon redistribution so redistribution is how how that stuff's going to move across the landscape a lot of it is is neglected um, thinking of how it mobilizes how it transported and how it becomes deposited so when we're going to try to tackle that you need to know one how much of it is moving how much of the material is moving so like your erosion your rate or if you get like a mass of that but also you need to go in and look and see um, how enriched that material is. So knowing that that rainfall is gonna become more intense, this how we treat our upper soil surface, which I like to call the soil active layer, um, that's kind of the skin or the interface of all of this. So how, how we protect it with either residue cover or you know, your canopies, promoting stronger resilient aggregates, increasing your microbial activity, within the soil to keep, you know, keep those things working and, and building the aggregation processes um, are really gonna have a big impact. So I'm showing here two different systems, a low biological activity and a high. And basically rainfall is coming down upon them and the kinetic energy of those drops is gonna hit it. So low biological activity, a um, lot of those um, aggregates within your, your soil structure there be, become weakened, the drops can collapse a lot of those pores as water starts to go in a lot of the pores within there can restrict and confine off and cause like a restrictive layer which promotes runoff to develop your splash and all the the beginning processes as i said about um, the erosion processes <clears throat> now you get into a higher biological activity stronger basically you're putting that water down into the soil column where it belongs so understanding that we have the that interface there, that, that soil active layer. And that's just within a little soil column we just looked. 
you know, what, what would happen, you know, if you look at a landscape response. So what we see in that top left there, that's a, like a little small catchment. And it's kind of has like the little drainage networks along there, lots of different fields and stuff are gonna be supplying this. So if you think about a depth of water that would occur during rainfall, and if you apply it to that, what would be this, what's the system response? You know, what's going in, what's gonna cause a, a runoff depth, what's just gonna cause shearing and, and different erosion processes to be able to transport material without that system. Um, a system imbalance, all of those little flow paths are moving water efficiently. It can handle the incoming versus outcome, outgoing. And because that system's been defined over, you know, hopefully uh, like a, a very long time scale. Um, if a system's out of balance, what, what I showed in that last slide is that you could have restricted active layers. A lot of this from intensive tillage, different, you know, more conventional managements that just are not harboring your more resilient aggregates. So if those start to restrict, basically you could think of it as concrete, you know, within all of your different areas there and think of it as a parking lot. So the rain, rain's coming down and water's moving way too quick. It's not having the time to go within the soil, triggering these massive runoff events, triggering massive erosion events. Um, the picture in the bottom right, this was around Iowa 2009, where we had one of these flashy, flashy floods come. And a lot of that is just due to an overwhelming amount of runoff, you know, supplied from all these fields in a short amount of time. So moving from soilscapes to landscapes. So knowing how dynamic that whole landscape is and the spatial representation of uh, properties and different managements that everybody's gonna be using in there, um, it's important to move away from a soilscape, which I like to think of as a, it's a homogenous unit of land. This is, this is representing um, the conditions within this area. However, soilscapes, they do account for the vertical fluxes. So incoming sources of, you know, dead plant material comes in, decomposition, cycling, um, and respiration out. But then they, they do not account for what's coming in and out of them. So lateral and upslope, downslope transport. And this does not account for any of the, the type of material that would be coming off of a certain section of soil and moving and propagating downslope as you've seen in some of those flow, tab, flow paths. What this can result in is, you know, high uncertainty and um, going out into a field. I mean, like I showed, there's gonna be a lot of different spots in that field where you're gonna have a lot of different carbon contents. A lot of that is because that movement and redistribution across the landscape. So this just adds to the whole, com the, the whole um, uncertainty within doing carbon budgets. Now, on the left here, you're gonna see just like a regular field there. Um, it looks pretty active on the landscape. You know, would you treat that whole system as just the, the lateral fluxes in and outs? Um, it looks like there's gonna be some, some changes there. So if you gridded that off and you treated each of those little squares as a separate little um, soilscape, you see that there's flow paths there. So a lot of movement, stuff's being transported along there redistributed along, along the downslope. Um, that little section there, the red block I, think of that as that little soilscape over on the right. And what you could do is you could account for those different inputs, outputs, and transport along, along the downslope to be able to make the landscape connected and to capture that um, heterogeneity. There's my arrow. Yep, let's point to that. Um, so anyway, what's needed is a more, landscape oriented approach in your thoughts to be able to capture those processes that are um, impacting a landscape. Just one second. So soil organic carbon redistribution. I'm gonna show you just a couple, um, some of the work I've done and some rainfall experiments in knowing kind of the process that I just, just described. Um, what I'm after in some of these experimental designs. Um, I work with some rainfall simulators on the top left. This is kind of our experimental setup. And basically we go out and rain on some plots. We put a weir at the bottom. It will look at kind of the time series and the response of runoff 
And basically within that runoff, you know, collecting samples to be able to take a look at the, at the sediment. And, and then more importantly, what are the characteristics of that sediment? So multiple different intensities we can use. We go around to different sections of there. That's kind of, if you go back at, in, on the slide before and, you know, one of those little um, gridded sections there, we're just trying to understand what's coming off of that, what would be transported, you know, to get some insight. And maybe even some development for some transport models in, within there. So those are being monitored on the upper right. You can see the your discharge rates, depth right there. You know, it's a continuous thing. And move this control box on my screen here one second. Oop. Did I go off of that? Oh, I'm sorry. So there's kind of a time series on that plot there. You see a runoff coefficient. So runoff coefficient is going to be um, depth of precipitation being applied, um, but it's the, the runoff that's being coming off of it compared to that, that depth of rainfall. So a value of one would be whatever's raining on is running off. Um, very low runoff coefficients means a lot of it's going into the soil. So not paying attention to exactly what those are. I'm just showing you kind of like the trends, um, you know, capturing that time series of the runoff. And then at different points in there, you can take a look at the sediment, which you see there. Um, important to note is that a lot of the material coming off of those is not just, again, the, the primary stuff. You have aggregates and different size fractions moving along there. And then looking within those size fractions and understanding you know, the whole dynamics of aggregates and, you know, what they're encapsulating. Um, by not accounting for those, you can be way um, under, over, you know, estimating your, your fluxes of soil carbon being moved within a, a storm event. So one thing I was working on developing was, can I relate that material coming off there? Can I get an idea of those size fractions? In, be able to relate that to a carbon concentration. So it's nice to be able to just measure, take your samples in, okay, what's my carbon content? You know, what, what's my nitrogen and so forth within there. Um, but for modeling frameworks, which I've worked on developing was to be able to use classic transport models that account for size fractions and to be able to simulate the different movement of those fractions with different events, and then be able to tie that back in and have an estimate of your your losses of carbon, you know, removing and transported during different um, intensities. So on the left over here, there's three different sections. So going back and knowing that we have a, a time series of the rainfall, those little dots are individually representing what what kind of this, what would be in the sediment, and that can be broken apart into um, through different sieving techniques, um, different size fractions within there. For this one, I, I have three shown. It's on the bottom there. It's less than 0 0.25 millimeter, uh, 0.25 to two, kind of a small macrogravigate sizes, and then a, a large one there. The solid, the solid line there is kind of what would be the average. So if you just took the whole thing and put it in a machine, hey, here's, here's what's in it. So kind of that weighted cumulative. Um, but what you see is that in the top left, you got your clays and your, and your silts. So, Enrichment is the the um, the ratio of the characteristics of the sediment compared to what was in the original soil. So enrichment of clay, um, if you look at your sediment moving, if it's you know higher higher content of clay than what was there, you'd have a more enriched. So values over one are going to show that you know a lot more of your fines are moving within those cases, and it tells a lot about. Um, the characteristics of a certain rainfall event, like right away you have some stripping of the, the aggregates and peeling off um, the outsides of it. And then as you go on, it might, you know, disrupt the whole aggregates and then large events, you may see that everything moving is very similar to um, the type of material that's there. So values usually go towards the value of one or unity. Um, so taking those, you can you can make a relation between the texture, and then the bottom there, the chemical, which I, um, the carbon contents. So on the on the right-hand side, what I found was there's a good agreement, it's been pretty well-established literature as well, that 
you know, your finer particles or your, your particle sizes can adhere carbon. So making that relation between um, the specific surface area of, of your sediment with your carbon and nitrogen that you can um, be able to use an enrichment um, ratio to be able to describe not only the amount of sediment moving, but um, what, what's within it or, you know, how enriched and, you know, carbon transport. And <clears throat> some of this can be applied to the fields and, and understanding, you know, different management. Um, how is the impact on the different drainage networks within there? Transport, how does that affect the spatial um, distribution of different properties? I'm just look at my time here. I'm going to hammer through here. All right. So this is one of our LTAR sites, a long-term ag site. Uh, I got it boxed off over there with that yellow and just looking some changes in management and seeing um, you know, how active the landscape has been in, in within um, just a two-year window. So what the system in the, in the first year was, was it's very conventional tilled, um, you know, no cover crops. It's just a corn soybean system. Two years later with cover crops and you know, no-till, there's been a dramatic response. Oops. So looking at those little arrows there, you can see the dynamic flow paths within the within the network. They're kind of showing how the water is going to move. And you see a lot of the properties there kind of follow that same trend. So the upper right, you see microbial biomass within the within the soil. Huge increase, almost um, I think it's 30% or more within the two years. So you're 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 protecting that soil surface, especially within that, that upper upper layer. You're promoting microbial um, activity, more aggregation, uh, more resistance to raindrop energy. You put more water in the ground. You can see the response there within your, your yields. You can start to see more of a homogenous yield start to develop um, over the two years there instead of some gaps in yield. So you start to decrease the impact on some landscapes there. And it gets um, a more homogenous across the landscape. Some of the other findings within there, looking at some of these aggregates, you can see there's just a lot of different contents within these different size fractions and how, how that relates to slopes. So there's a, a good trend in there of inverse proportional to slopes. So if you look at this kind of a line of these here and you look at what carbon content is in these different size fractions, you could see that it's a pretty good you know, range. And understanding the importance of accounting for those aggregates within you do in your, in your redistribution and um, accounting for that within um, SOC you know, transport. So the, the circles on there represent kind of that weighted, you know, if you took the whole sample and you know, combustion or whatever, you burn it, this is what the carbon content would be. But um, the importance of understanding the sizes and the distribution of them and moving to be able to better account for transport within here. And again, this could be applied again to the, to the rainfall, the breakdown, you can see kind of a nice little snapshot there of some of those organics within the soil being broken out and you know, dislodged during, during storm events. And what those can have as, as impacts then on, on allowing water to move in and out of the out of the soil profile, which is going to be at that direct interface for higher rainfall events and, and more dramatic um, precipitation events. And I'm going to show this last thing here and then I'm going to wrap it. You know, um, some of the experiments I'm running is just isolating those aggregates and seeing how they break down in time and kind of what's, what's the response there, because I believe that we could take our aggregates and it can provide kind of an x-ray of what would happen in your field. So if you go out and, and perform a gridded sampling and you know the characteristics of weak aggregates compared to strong or what's, what's in them or what's the distribution of fractions, you could kind of uncover some patterns within your landscape and understand that you know, if you did apply a depth of water, you know, some areas it's going to go in, some are going to be very restrictive. You can kind of um, uncover your um, flow path networks, you know, understand why you have different areas in your field that, you know, are, 
struggling to get your yields up, they have low carbon content. It's because it's restricted with infiltrations. You got weak aggregates, collapse poor networks. Um, and then just to be able to, to bring that in kind of a systems approach to be able to better estimate um, kind of your accounting for S, you know, your carbon redistributions in, in the whole um, system. So summary, landscape processes are causing all this heterogeneity of not only your soil properties, but it propagates. And so it affects your, your different cycles, your uh, microbial turnovers, and this will affect your productions and so forth. So the erosion impact, it not only affects just removing the material, but it shapes kind of your, your future um, productivity and supplies of material to be able to um, spur the nutrient cycles. And to be able to estimate some of these fluxes, we need to know not only what, how much of the material is moving, but how enriched it is. So accounting for those size fractions and what, what's, what's the characteristics of them as they move across the landscape. And to treat our soil active layer as a very important piece in all this, because it is that interface of the soil water interactions to be able to build resiliency towards whatever weather change we see coming. And within that, that active layer, if we promote a stable microclimate, so something that's not getting flushed out all the time from you know, your rainfall events and um, collapsing all those pores where they live in, in there, they'll promote you know, better biogeochemical cycling, stronger aggregates to be able to further um, build resiliency. And lastly, um, if you can't get out and run rainfall experiments and different things within different parts of your fields, looking at your aggregates, I think is, is you could slap that out x-ray, like if you're a doctor and say, okay, well, here's your aggregates. This tells me your tillage intensity is this, you know, so it shifts it here. You know, the distributions of that will tell you kind of a, an inference of how much time you would have also, um, in a rainfall event, you know, when there'd be a collapsing within those poor networks. So all these things could be helped to kind of better understand the processes involved and to be able to accurately provide better estimates of carbon budgets by accounting for the redistribution. So with that, I thank everyone and I'm glad to answer any questions. Here's some of the acknowledgements of funding and different collaborators throughout some of these projects. Claire, if, if Claire, you're speaking, you're, you're on mute. Oh, you're muted, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> I just had a panic um, attack. I thought like I was <laughs> unmuted the whole time. I'm like, I just talked for that long and nonsense. Uh, yeah, so I'll just ask a couple of questions. So I was saying that um, <clears throat> when, in one of our talks last year, Christine Morgan was talking about carbon sampling technologies. And she made the point that although carbon distribution is highly heterogeneous on the landscape, it's structured. And that gives us some hope for our strategic um, stratified sampling protocols to be able to monitor carbon changes over time. And I think a lot of the work that you just presented gives us very nice mechanistic framework for understanding where carbon goes and um, and and how, um, how, how it can mechanistically potentially be modeled eventually. So I guess my question is, um, if you were to pick certain processes that would be a priority for including in carbon models, what would you pick? I would like to bring in, I'm trying to bring in, <laughs> I want to bring in the ag aggregate stability term um, as kind of the interface for the rainfall, you know, being applied to the soil. So usually it's, they don't use an energy approach. It's, you know, traditional flow equation. So whenever your depth and everything's, you know, steady state model, but I think that there's a lot missing by the energy, you know, being applied and, and the response of the aggregates, you know, they think that it's, it's very misrepresentative of when 
when it's going to actually, you know, runoff will be triggered and so forth. But so how you treat your aggregates, I think it's a really good holistic way to cover a lot of ground because I think it can reflect infiltration rates and also resilience to those drops and, you know, kind of your, even for respirations and so forth. So it's kind of a, a way to tell a lot of things with not that much work to get that information. So I think it could be in, implemented very easily in a lot of different, in a lot of different scales and so forth. People should have that data. Okay, and then um, the last question I'll ask you is, do you take the underlying stratigraphy into account um, when, I guess this is in the, in the context of if, if you were to model um, surface carbon movement, do you take the underlying stratigraphy into account as well? Um, you know, like there's a parent layer, I guess, like for, for some of those frameworks, it's super important. I mean, uh, deep layer or anything you start getting below the surface is, well, I guess that's funny. You scratch below the surface. Um, but no, it, it needs to be better, better accounted and, and connected in there. Um, much more emphasis to connect subsurface with surface, but you know, a lot of this that I presented was just, just that interface knowing, you know, what's coming. Then then that's kind of where I was at. Okay, great. So we have um, gotten to an hour, so I gotta let people go, but I just wanna thank both of our speakers so much again for joining us. And to all the attendees, I hope that you'll join us next month in March where we'll be taking up the issue of carbon saturation and how that affects um, sequestration potential. So thank you, everyone.